Hello everyone, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it's good to see you all. I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, the, the theme that we have uh, uh, on uh, Mira Beta Engineer, from which I basically understand that uh, uh, parents all around this country, this large country for us, are quite desperate to see, especially the sons, become engineers. We travel to any part of the country and what you have is uh, coaching institutes where uh, you get trained in uh, mathematics in particular, but all every, every other subject which you are required to, to crack one of these exams, whether for the IITs or uh, you know, BITS or some other exam. I'm going to talk a little bit about the consequences of uh, this obsession with engineering, what it has done to uh, how it has had perverse effects on the country's higher education system. Uh, it has served us well, some, some of us would like to believe, uh, because after all, IIT graduates have been doing so well uh, in the US, uh, especially since uh, the IT revolution began sometime in the 1990s. So where do we really begin the story? The first point, as I said, is there is absolutely no doubt that we as a society are obsessed with engineering. So Mera Beta Engineer, I think, uh, is, is, uh, is a very apt expression. Uh, and I have to congratulate you for, for coming up with something like this. It is rather obvious, but it is not something which is talked about uh, as much as it should. What's the real problem here? The real problem is that there is a serious deficit of half-decent colleges in this country. And that includes engineering colleges. So even though, even though, as a, you know, if you look at the total number of students who are going to college, a majority, majority of them are uh, headed to arts and science colleges, not to engineering colleges. So engineering and management actually, uh, students actually constitute a minority. But they're supposed to be the best. I mean, the, if, you, if you do engineering, the, the popular conception is that you'll become somebody in life. Mera beta engineer banega, and therefore uh, will succeed, will become uh, happy, will be happy, rich, and you know, all those other things. Now given that there are such few good colleges, including such few good engineering colleges, what it means is, the obsession with engineering, what it means is that a good number of students end up going to really bad colleges. And uh, when you think of really bad colleges, uh, I guess uh, you know I have in mind colleges in Tamil Nadu or Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka in particular. These are the states with the highest number of private engineering colleges. Uh, engineering colleges have proliferated in these states with the blessings of and with the participation of uh, political leaders and business people. And it's very hard to make a distinction between the two these days. What I have been reading is that uh, there are now so many engineering colleges that they are unable to fill up their seats. The second thing you have to remember is that unemployability rates of India's graduates, whether from engineering or any other discipline, remain very, very high. Uh, one survey put it at about 50%, the other put it at about 30%. So let's say about 30 to 50% only only 30 to 50 percent of graduates are immediately employable in any sector of the economy. So three years of college or four, uh, what you find yourself uh, is that you still do not have the skills to, to uh, make a living. So when you choose, when, when, when parents or, or students obsess over getting admitted into an engineering college and end up going to one of these uh, you know, less than decent colleges in Karnataka or Andhra Pradesh or Tamil Nadu, it really does nothing for anyone. It doesn't do anything for the student, it doesn't do anything for the parents, uh, it doesn't do anything for the larger society. Unemployability, of course, is a big social problem. It threatens to become uh, one of India's biggest problems. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, it runs into millions. Everything in this country runs into millions. Uh, but you have uh, a few million people entering college every year and a few million, more than a few million, actually graduating every year and looking for jobs. And there are either two things. 
there are either not enough jobs or these graduates don't have the skills to get a job. What you have at the end of four years or three years is a degree, not an education. And that, in part, is because, let's say, uh, you know, somebody who is 16, 17 years old, finishing school, would have ideally preferred to become, I don't know, a plumber, maybe, if there were no societal pressures at all. Uh, acquire some technical skills. I mean, you have a construction boom in this country, and sure, you need engineers, but you need plumbers as well. You need carpenters. I mean, anywhere you come from, uh, ask around, how many decent carpenters do you have in, in that town or city? And we'll, we'll be told, well, there's one guy who lives in that particular gully, and you know, and you go to that guy, he says, oh, well, there's so much construction going on, I have so much work, I really can't help you until you know, the next six months or after a year and so on and so forth. What I'm getting at is that this obsession with one discipline, engineering in particular, but to, to some extent, ah, of course, after engineering, you have to do, uh, you have to get a management degree, you know, which again serves very little purpose because again, in management, beyond the IMs and a half a dozen other, uh, you know, decent management institutes or colleges, and especially in the bigger cities, uh, you have nothing. It's a, it's a desert. It's a management desert, so to say. Uh, we should also know. I mean, this is this is interesting information. Uh, that most of our colleges, better colleges and universities, are located in tier one cities. Uh, a few in tier two cities, but overall, across all disciplines, uh, if you do not head to a college in a big city, in a large enough city, then really you have no future, because this is where uh, employers go. Uh, when, when they are looking to hire graduates, they do not go beyond these tier one and maybe select tier two cities. So there is no, uh, there's no way for somebody, let's say, uh, who, who acquires an education, despite the poor quality of college or university he or she attends, there's no way to signal to an employer, hey, I have the skills to be employed. So the perverse effects that I mentioned right at the beginning, these are the sorts of perverse effects that our obsession with engineering has bred. Now, a little bit more about the quality uh, part. The Indian higher education, the, the, the way the system is organized, the way you know, universities and colleges are organized, and the way the University Grants Commission or the Ministry of Human Resources and Development looks after it, uh, it has made entry costs very, very high. Which is to say, if you want to open, let's say I have a few billions, like uh, Mr. Premji did. And I decided, well, I want to open a good engineering college. Now, and I'm perfectly honest about it. I have good intentions, and I also get the right kind of people to help me with this enterprise. And uh, like most other um, colleges and universities, private universities, I'm really not into this for profits. But then when I go to the government, when I go to the UGC, uh, I find that uh, actually even to open a university college, which is uh, going to help our young people, acquire, get a decent education, not just a degree, uh, you know, I have to uh, pay up. This is in addition to the costs I think, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> which I'm setting aside to open the university. So entry costs are very, very high. Uh, entry costs, some people have argued, should be low. Anybody who wants to open a college, go ahead. We need colleges, right? We don't have enough of them. And when we have enough of them, they are, they are poor quality. That's the real problem. So the entry costs are high. And once you are in, you are in. There's no regulation there. There's no real regulation there. How do we know, for example, you are a prospective student. How do you know that uh, you want to do engineering, all right? Or you want to do, let's say, uh, God help you, physics. Uh, or worse still, history. Uh, how do you know which college to go to? You can look at, say, India Today ratings, you know, rankings of colleges. Now, let me tell you this. Uh, you have World University rankings. Uh, we don't figure, which is all right. Um, but even the World University rankings have been criticized for limitations in their methodology, which is to say uh, those rankings give you some idea about the quality of universities, which is to say, yes, at MIT or at Harvard or at Oxford, they, they are really, really good. But after that, let's say you get past 50 or 100, uh, there's very little separating one university from the other. I mean, 
Um, so let's say university which is ranked 100 and university which is ranked 150. You know, really, how much of a difference there is? Once you take away the top 20, 30, really, or I would say even the top 50. After 50, there is a gap. And then the gap is so little between, say, universities ranked between 50 and 150, the next 100 and the next 100, that it's impossible to say why a particular university should rank number 72 and another should rank 144. You know, you get up. So the methodology used by QS, for example, has come in for particular criticism. Uh, the methodology used by Times Higher Education, uh, it's supposed to be better, uh, but still it has its limitations. Uh, the rankings produced by uh, Shanghai people, uh, they're also good, but again with important limitations. Now think about it, uh, when India Today or Outlook or when Careers 360 uh, produces its list of rankings, um, in, in terms of methodology, how poor must they be? I mean, it's just, you know, half a dozen people who come together, uh, you know, to, to produce that special issue. That's it. Whereas if you look at uh, the number of people who are involved and the kind of effort uh, the Times Higher Education people, uh, education people put in uh, into producing global uh, university rankings, the difference is enormous. So uh, my point is this, you cannot really trust, I mean, or uh, let me put it this way, how much can you trust these rankings produced by India Today or Outlook or Careers 360? The second uh, um, way to, to understand the quality of uh, higher education institutions is to look at NAC uh, um, ratings. You know, so a college or university with A uh, is obviously better than uh, one which has a B. Now the problem is that only about 20% of public colleges and universities uh, have accreditation from NAC. The rest were not required. Now they will be going to NAC and suddenly NAC will have to, uh, you know, figure out a way how to, how to grade about 700 odd universities out of which maybe 100 have uh, been graded, 600 odd universities and about 40,000 odd colleges and institutes or maybe 30 to 35. Uh, take away those which have some kind of accreditation. And remember, uh, the, the grade that NAC gives is valid for five years. So many of them which have a grade right now, uh, they'll be expiring within the next two years or so. What I'm saying is one single organization looking after, you know, about 48,000 uh, colleges and institutes and 700 universities. Second, the interesting thing is that private universities are not required to have uh, a grade from NAC. Why? Because, uh, you know, it's just that way. So the point is, if you are in the market, in the higher education market, once you're in, you make money. And the only thing coming in your way is, the only thing coming in your way is students. Once you, as students, understand, potential or you know, <laughs> actual students, once you understand that uh, uh, that it's all about you know getting a particular number of students, that all these so-called non-profits are really you know uh, or profiteering organizations. They're really profiteering organizations. Something of that sort seems to have happened, at least over the last two years. Uh, the shadiest uh, management uh, and engineering colleges and institutes have not been uh, able to fill up their seats. So uh, several colleges in Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, they had 5,000 seats and they filled up 500. Oh, that's wonderful. So in that sense, uh, the market is doing its own regulation. But again, here, the issue is, what will the UGC do here? What will the MHRD do here? If you have a surplus of, if this is interpreted as having a surplus of engineering colleges, will it stop me with my four billion rupees or whatever uh, from investing in higher education? And investing not for a profit, for a non-profit, for a good cause. Will somebody, will somebody from the government say, well, you know, we have all these colleges in Tamil Nadu, they're not filling up their seats. Uh, why do you want to open an engineering college? You say, your fair response is, well, these are all terrible engineering colleges and I want to open a really good engineering college. They'll say, no, no, but you can't. You should not. We won't let you because we are here to regulate the higher education sector in terms of quantity, not, not so much quality. Because nobody, I mean, how many colleges get shut down every year? 
Very few. Very few. In fact, I mean, until until somebody really got after the, 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 the chap, Arindam Chaudhary, uh, IIPM was making merry, was it not? Recently, uh, somebody pointed out that uh, there's a university, a new private university in Gujarat, uh, which got an award from FIKI. Right? Now, it seems that uh, the, the, somebody from the family of uh, Rai University was on the jury, you know, picking up the best new private university. Now, the whole system is rigged. I mean, the sooner we understand this, that the whole higher education system is really rigged. I mean, think of, uh, you know, it's, it's a jungle out there. I mean, it's really free market at its worst. And there's no way to really ascertain the quality of any institution. So when you think of engineering colleges, when you think about you know, your, your, your uh, brothers or sisters, I mean, you must have children, uh, you know, or you yourself, you have come to, to BITS, which is a decent uh, institution. Uh, but think about it. If everyone goes to these engineering colleges, where will they end up? They'll end up unemployed. They'll end up socially frustrated, they'll end up as outsiders. And in the meanwhile, you have spent all this money and you have these people laughing all the way to the back. And there's nothing, nothing that we can do about it. Thank you.